taking her out for a drive. She might appreciate the sound of being playing around with the carburetor, tuning it and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it's such a beautiful day today. So here we are at a place called Dana Point. I think this is Strands Beach or something along those lines. And finally, the Trans Am is back. It's in my hands, I've got the keys, I'm sitting in it. It's done. I've got quite a lot to talk about because this has been quite the roller coaster. It was supposed to take two months. It took a year and three and a half, almost four months to get done. Let's start her up and let's head out. Ah, oh, there we go. Love the shaker hood. I mean, I think that's absolutely fantastic. It's such a cool thing to watch it shake in there when you rev the engine. Anyway, uh, time for us to get going. Now, I happen to be what I consider to be the most epic, beautiful um, road to drive on in America, which is the uh, Pacific Coast Highway. I'm actually right at the bottom end of it, you know, before it kind of just um, stops. I'm gonna head up on the Pacific Coast Highway a little bit, and we're gonna talk about this. Unfortunately, we've got this thing called, uh, in California, we've got this thing called the Maritime Layer, something like that. And so on a day like this, if you drive inland like, I don't know, five minutes, it's all bright and sunny, but it's just foggy as all heck out here. So apologies in advance about the uh, kind of gray skies and uh, lack of beautiful scenery, which I was hoping we'd get today. But I'm on a time limit here. I have got two and a half days to get back to Pennsylvania for our podcast. And look, there's just no way I'm going to make it. So. I'll explain to you what happened. I thought I could make it. I came down, I was gonna pick up the car, I was gonna drive it all the way back, but there were a lot of complications. Somehow, and I don't know how, but the shop, you know, the body shop that this car was in, which, by the way, I've got incredibly mixed feelings about, um, they did a pretty good job on the bodywork. Bodywork and paint's actually really nice. The bodywork is great, paint is, I'll give it an eight out of 10. I'm happy with it. I'm never going to have to change it, you know, little touch-ups here and there. Um, but they're obviously not mechanics. And so they actually broke the car. <laughs> and by broke the car, I mean it wouldn't start anymore. When I dropped it off, it was running perfectly. Air conditioning was still working. That doesn't work anymore, spoiler. Um, and of course, the car just ran. It was really good. But it wouldn't start, so uh, I had to get a towed. So I got a towed from the place to a buddy's house <clears throat> where I've been working on it for the last two days. That's eaten up my whole like time budget that I was gonna drive back is, you know, fixing this thing. So uh, I'll explain to you what happened. Somehow they had pinched the wires when putting the fender back on. The wires that go and give the positive energy from the battery to the alternator, which then feeds into the ignition system and all that. So the ignition wasn't working at all. I mean, if you turned on the ignition, nothing. No lights, no buzzer, no fan, no anything. So I had to make a kind of an emergency rerouting of the wiring and I bought a bunch of wires and patched up the broken stuff. And obviously, I don't know, I thought it was a fusible link that had gone or something, but I couldn't trace it anyway. I ended up fixing it by um, manually sort of connecting directly from the battery to the alternator. I've run tests, it's safe, it's okay, it's good enough for me to drive until I can replace a whole bunch of the wiring under the hood. Anyway, that was the main first problem. Then it wasn't running on all cylinders, um, which was because they'd obviously siphoned all the gas out of the tank. It's kind of frustrating. When I got the car, it had zero, and I mean zero gas in the tank, not even a, enough to start, not even a, a cup of gas. So, you know. When I dropped it off, it had a full tank. And of course, yeah, look, it's been a year and so like three, four months, but gas doesn't evaporate that quickly. Anyway, whatever. So they obviously ran it dry and usually that would be a very bad thing, but I just replaced the fuel tank in this with a brand new one. So there's no junk sitting at the bottom to be sucked up. So it's not a big deal, but it's a carburetor. If you don't run these things, they tend to come up, issues happen. And I ended up replacing the cap, the rotor. Inside the uh, distributor, you've got all these weights and balances that were rusty enough for not being used. 
had to lube those all up. Uh, replaced all of the spark plug wires. Spark plugs are still new from, you know, a year and a bit ago when I replaced them, so I didn't need to replace those. Um, a bunch of vacuum lines I had to replace, all that kind of thing, and I actually got it all going. Now, you might think I'm crazy, but I actually took it in because its registration had run out. You know, you have to register um, your car every year here in the States. And um, I could have just waited till I get back to Pennsylvania, but the thing is, the car had run out, and it was kind of getting to that point where they start fining you for late payments and stuff. So I just went in and got it smogged, and uh, believe it or not, it passed. I mean, obviously, that's after me working on it and getting all the stuff sorted out, but it passed smog, and now it's fully registered again with a California plate. The reason I'm doing that is, nice big uh, truck there. The reason I'm doing that is up in Pennsylvania, whenever I drive around with a California plate, like the truck that I drove up there, get a lot of uh, like interesting interactions. Let me put it that way. People are like, oh, big boy from California, you know, that kind of nonsense. So I kind of want to keep the California plate on this. And I also got one of those really sexy black plates. I don't really want to get rid of it that soon. So you've got a couple of months to sort it out. And once you've been up there for like, I think it's six months or something, you have to. Uh, change it over to a local plate. So I'll be doing that eventually, but I'm going to hold on to my uh, California plate for as long as I can. Anyway, you know, that aside, there was a ton of other things. Like, for instance, the door. There's a striker inside the door. And um, now, to be fair, they had to weld a whole new patch because previously, due to some kind of accident or something or whatever the case, the striker, the striker plate where the striker actually you know, mounts to the door jam. That had been damaged, and so they have kind of made a real bodge job of it. So it had to be cut out, a new one put in. But they didn't tighten the striker, so I'm riding down the road, and the door starts to, like, knock around and almost came off the, you know, almost opened on its own. I had to stop and fix that, which is not a good thing. There were a bunch of loose things underneath the hood I had to fix. I mean, let's just put it this way. I really need to go through this car with a fine tooth comb before I'm confident driving it across country. So I made, an, I made a decision. I still, I've missed this car. I need to drive it. I need to be behind the wheel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drive it down to Arizona. I've got a buddy there and he's organizing for a shipping company that he knows for a very reasonable price um, to ship the car up to Pennsylvania. So that still gives me a kind of a road trip. I still get to work out all the bugs in the system. I got a trunk full of tools and spare parts. Um, and so that's kind of how it's gonna go. So it won't take me long. It'll take me probably the whole of today. I, obviously I'll only arrive there kind of late at night, but I'm just gonna drive to Arizona and ship the car from there. Shipping, shipping's gonna happen tomorrow. I've already booked my ticket to fly out of Arizona back home. So that's the plan. Let me think, what else was wrong with this thing? Um, well, for one, all the little bits of trim, like the dome light, they uh, lost that, little bits of trim for the windows and stuff. In fact, when I got it back, it didn't have the trim around the, um, the rear window and the windscreen. And they said it's because it was too difficult for them to put on, you know. Hey, look, I don't blame them. I put them on and I had trouble because the replacement trim that you buy these days made out of a very soft aluminium and so when you try to put it on and put it on the clips it just bends and warps and it's really terrible the old stuff is solid I don't know what it's made out of steel or something but it's just easy to clip on so I actually um, ended up putting a hybrid of some of the new trim and some of the old trim together to kind of make it work just so that it doesn't look unfinished as I drive it another massive issue though these re these bloody roofs now these I you can hear them rattling around up there it's really freaking annoying that is uh, what we call an aftermarket set of cars and concepts t-tops anyone who's ever owned one of these cars or a Camaro of the same age or even a third gen um, if you've been unlucky enough to get your car with cars and concepts uh, t-tops you know the pain Basically, there was this company that would fit these aftermarket T-tops at the dealer. You know, so when you buy a car, you either bought it with T-tops or you didn't, okay? But if you bought one without T-tops, you wanted T-tops, you could tell the dealer to install these. 
And so they get a guy come over, he literally just cut the roof off, bolt on this whole system. And it's not a good system. It's very flimsy. It looks great though, I must say. The actual, it actually looks cosmetically when it's on the car, not when it's off, when it's off it looks like crap. When it's on the car, it actually looks better than the, the factory Fisher T-tops. But the problem is, there are no parts available for these T-tops. There's no rubber, you know, seals. I mean, there are no rubber seals. There are no latches. There's no replacement T-tops if you break them. And so the shop took off the rubber, even though I told them, hey, listen, these things are precious. You, you can never find the rubber for these things. Don't take it off. They took off the rubber and lost the bloody rubber all the seals so I've been struggling with that I actually ordered a, overnighted a, a set of trunk you know weather stripping and I saw a video online that actually says you can modify trunk weather stripping to work and guess what it worked so I now have um, that's what's squeaking up there <laughs> trunk weather stripping I had to do a lot of extra work with all these, these brackets up here and it was really difficult and I had to do some modifications to make sure it actually all stays on there Anyway, long story short, I couldn't drive anywhere without the, the roof. I'm certainly not going to drive into Arizona with the uh, sun beating down on me all day with the T-tops off. And, uh, well, also for wind and stuff. There's another problem too. I can't close the windows. Um, I don't mind right now. It's awesome. The weather's great. But if it gets cold at night or, you know, anything like that, it's not something you want, open windows. I can't close them because um, the guys at the shop, when they were fitting everything, they didn't know how to fit certain parts of the door. And like, for instance, there's a remote uh, little toggle thing to control the side mirrors. And that nonsense, they couldn't install properly, so they've just stuck that whole bundle of wires down in there. And um, if I try to open and close the windows, it's just going to get snarled up and all of that. So again, I'm going to have to take the door cards off and sort that out. That's another little niggle. Uh, look. I could go on and on about all the little problems that I have with this car. Uh, they lost the windscreen wiper arms, for instance. That kind of thing. It's actually kind of annoying. I gave them a lot of new parts which also just somehow disappeared. Like the new door sills and things. Uh, anyway, it's back. So anyway, that's the negative out of the way. I know people usually start with the positive and then move on to the negative, right? That's the negative. I, no, nothing else you know from the off the top of my head is wrong with the car uh, I went through the whole thing I fixed a whole bunch of crap I for instance got the heater working again it wasn't working um, all that kind of stuff anyway let's talk about the positives of this car and that's pretty easy I cannot drive this thing without having a massive smile on my face you know me and this car have been through a lot I got it, I drove it for a couple of months. I worked on it nonstop for a couple of months. Even way before, you know, I moved, I was living in an apartment, I moved into a house, now I've moved into a different state. But it still was registered in the original apartment that I was in, you know, that kind of thing. I was working on it in a, in a tiny little apartment garage. Um, I fixed all sorts of niggles. This is my dream car, I'm gonna keep it forever. I. You know what, I'm really considering replacing the roof with a, with a hardtop because originally from the factory this car was a hardtop car. And that would get rid of all this creaky, squeaky nonsense. It would stiffen the, the car up. It would be better. Anyway, this car is fantastic. Every single time I drive it, it's, a, it's an experience. And it's a good experience. I cannot explain to you how comfortable it is. You know, I've had other older American muscle cars had that 68 Corvette, which I completely restored from a piece of junk. Never really loved that car. I mean, I thought it was cool, but never really loved it. I had the C4 Corvette. I've got the, the 1990 Firebird that you've seen on this channel a lot. And I tell you what, all of those cars, every single one, are horrendous to drive. I mean, absolutely horrendous. Worst cars to drive ever. You get inside of them, they feel cheap inside, you drive, they're crashy and rattly and all cheap and uh, even worse, they're uncomfortable. I mean, the, the 1990 Firebirds got much tighter, sportier suspension. 
Um, the C4 Corvette also had the tighter, sportier suspension, but it it hurts. You can't go on a long road trip in those cars. You know, you feel the bumps and the you know the the cars are not good for just cruising. 68 Corvette had manual brakes. It didn't even have you know brake booster. And you know they're manual. I prefer manual cars personally, but this car is just a dream. I don't know how because it's so old and it's so kind of worn out. Well, at least it was when I got it, but um, this car is beautiful to drive. It's carbureted, yes, it's got a Rochester Quadrajet, which by the way, I actually like. As soon as I get an op opportunity, I'll open it up and show you why I like it. Um, but it's smooth, it doesn't skip a beat. It's, I put a little bit of power down, it's got the power, it's smooth, it gives it to me. and. It honestly feels like I'm driving a luxury car. It, it floats. It just floats. I don't know if it's the soft old suspension. I don't know if it's the big fat tires on the thing. Um, the fact that it's got an automatic, it's a, it's a turbo TH350 for those of you who want to know what it is. Um, I just don't know, but it's a combination of everything makes this car an absolute dream. And it's no slouch. I mean, yeah, it is a slouch. It's, it's not fast. But when you put your foot down, you can get a little bit of performance out of it. You can get a little bit of a smile, a little bit of that uh, in the back of your seat kind of feel. And uh, I, I could literally, if I wasn't concerned about some little niggly things like the fact that I don't know if everything's bolted down properly yet and potential fire hazards with the wiring and stuff, I could just drive this across country. Now, I'm not unprepared, by the way. As you can see, I carry a fire extinguisher in reach, just here at the back. And that's something that I think anyone who drives any of these old muscle cars should have anyway. You just don't know if a fuel line's going to burst or something weird's going to go on because these things are old, man. This car's older than me. It's two years older than me. Actually, three since it was made in 1977. Um, but you know what? The amount of thumbs up I get, the amount of people asking about the car and yeah I'll tell you what gets a bit tired when you hear people like shouting oh Smokey and the Bandit <sighs> I mean I specifically didn't want to have a gold eagle and all that because I don't want it to be the, the Smokey and the Bandit car I've just loved these cars since I was a kid um, and not because of that movie I actually only saw that movie when I was an adult um, I've just always loved the look of these things even though they weren't in South Africa they were never sold but a few people had imported them and I remember seeing one and I was like what what is that beautiful car and it is it's beautiful I I honestly don't think that there's a better looking car in my own opinion um, like the, the whole package it's got it's got good lines it's sexy it's sleek but it's also muscular and it's special and it's it's kitchen it's gaudy you know with that big bird on the hood and the all the little air extractors on the the you know on the fenders and all the other little bits and pieces that make it unique that little ducktail spoiler at the back which is one of my favorite things um, it's just it's kind of a timeless design sure it's like a 70s disco era car but it looks like it's a modern car. It looks like it's sophisticated. I don't know how to put it. And yeah, you'll get people arguing that whatever, you know, Lamborghini, or Ferrari, or a Porsche or something is a better car. And yeah, absolutely they are better cars. But they just don't look as good to me. Um, I honestly, I could be offered a Ferrari right now to trade for this car, and I wouldn't do it. I mean, if I did do it, I would sell the Ferrari and buy another one of these and keep the change. Um, because this is my car you know this is the car that suits me this is the car that I love this is the car that um, has been a, a lifelong pursuit for me to be honest and a lot of you might not know this but in South Africa I owned probably one of if not the only 1978 Trans Am that was ever imported. It was a piece of trash. We call it the trash am. Um, it was, you know, you, if you can imagine if a, a car has spent its entire life in a redneck trailer park being passed to every single redneck who 
thinks that he's a, I don't know, like a hero at the stoplights or whatever, and just does donuts and burnouts and completely trashed. Half the car was fiberglass, um, all rusty, didn't have the right wheels on it. It didn't have the right engine. Someone put a 350 Chevy in there and uh, the, there weren't even rear brakes on the thing because they would do burnouts. They just took those off. It was a complete piece of crap. But you know, I, I lusted after this car my entire life and I had one, but it was just junk. And there was no, there was no way I could ever bring that car back unless of course I completely uh, restored it and I didn't have the money to even give it a paint job back then. Never mind uh, fix all the problems with it. So I had it, but it wasn't the real thing. And now I have a real one. This is a California car. It comes from California. I've got, all, I've got the sales receipt that shows all the options. It's a real Trans Am. Um, it used to be white with a blue bird on the hood, yes. When I got it, it had been badly painted black. You've seen this, if you've seen the previous episode. The paint job was terrible. The uh, bodywork that's been done on this car, um, previously was horrendous there were gouges massive gouges down the side down the door both doors had damage to them um, the rear quarter panel on the passenger side was a complete mess absolutely terrible basically just made out of bondo uh, like I said the door strikers bodge jobs there were holes cut in the, the inner fenders there's all sorts of crap and weird stuff that's happened to this car in the past Obviously, it was in a bad accident, and whoever owned it at that point basically just took it to some kind of backyard body shop or someone in a field, and they used Bondo to kind of make it look okay. But the paint job was terrible. It still had the white and the door jams, everything. Now it's had a proper down-to-metal paint job. So now it's proper black. It's correct. The paint looks great. Um, I've seen what it looks like. There's no hidden rust on the car. Uh, I've replaced one of the fenders. The other fender had a huge bit of rust cut out of it. We're basically talking about a car that is no secrets anymore for me. Uh, and that's what I like. And so I can take it from here and keep improving it. And um, I have a question for all of you guys who watch this channel because obviously there's a lot of small niggles I'm going to fix on the car. By the way, I don't know if you can see how nice it looks out there, the coast. Um, yeah, you know, this it's a beautiful part of the world here. See, it seems like the maritime layer is clear, cleaning up a little bit. Anyway, here's a question I have for all of you guys. Let's wait for this uh, windy part to get over. Let me open it up a bit. Okay. okay. So here's the question I have for all of you guys. Should I do an engine swap? I'm going to tell you personally, I kind of like this engine. I know it's the worst, it's kind of the worst engine ever. It's a uh, Oldsmobile 403 and uh, it was the only engine option in California in 1977 and 78 so you know you couldn't get the the more powerful Pontiac 400 um, but it's really grown on me I don't know I don't know how to explain it like just the the way it performs the way it responds it's smooth and it's sluggish but it's got torque and it's nice should I build this engine up because um, after doing a lot of research online, you can quite easily get about 400 horsepower out of them if you just put different heads, uh, proper um, headers, and an intake, and a couple of other things like that. You can get about 400 horsepower without too much effort. Um, or should I throw in a Pontiac 400 crate motor? I kind of like the idea of keeping it all numbers matching though. I don't know, what do you think? Um, definitely not an LS. Um, I just feel like I love the LS motors, I think they're amazing, but I feel like just doing another LS swap is kind of boring. Um, and you know, this is an old Pontiac, I, I feel like it should have a, kind of the, the engine it was supposed to be born with, you know what I mean? Anyway, let me know guys, I'm very curious to hear. 
Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you why I like the, the Quadrajet carburetor so much. Well, wait until I get to a stoplight and I'll show you. I made this functional, this uh, hood scoop functional. And that means when the secondary is open on this carburetor, you get a wonderful sound. Let's see if I can get it. Let's go for it. Punch it. Oh yeah. Okay, watch. I'm going to just accelerate a little bit. Those are the primaries. You don't really get any noise, but if I punch it, listen. Listen to that, that howl. I mean, that's the thing. Yes, I could replace this, this whole thing with modern fuel injection or whatever, but it's that sound. It's that sound when those secondaries open. It's beautiful, you know? So this car feels and sounds fast, even though I know it's slower than your mom's Toyota Camry. <laughs> I'll do it one more time and then I'm going to wrap up. Primaries are nice and silent. Let's punch it. Oh, yes. Oh, it sounds so good. Oh. Oh, one more thing. Um, this car's not slow. It's great on the highway. I can cruise at about 70 miles an hour at about 2,200 RPMs thereabouts and uh, I mean it easily gets up to 85, 90 on the highway with no problems so I mean I haven't pushed it to try and get a top speed yet but I tell you what it really is a super nice smooth highway cruiser if that makes sense it doesn't seem like it's that kind of car if you look at it but that's actually what it is <laughs> anyway to wrap it up guys beautiful car puts a smile on my face I feel like I'm the king of the road whenever I'm driving this thing I absolutely love it it is a boyhood dream come true I'm kind of living my best life if that makes sense driving this thing around um, I couldn't be happier and it can only get better from here that's the thing I'm just gonna keep working on it fixing it it's gonna be a rolling project I'm gonna make sure that it never again reaches a stage where it's gonna be out of my hands for a bloody year, never mind a month. Every single project I do in this car, I want to make sure I can finish it in a weekend or a week or something so I can be back on the road because driving this car is just an experience that I need to enjoy for the rest of my life. Thank you so much, guys, for coming along on this uh, amazing, I don't know what to say, journey of disappointment, highs and lows. But the car's back, and you're going to see it a lot in the future. Um, anyway, until next time, you know the drill. Keep it between the ditches. Um, there's a Ferrari, uh, sorry, a Lamborghini behind me, but you know what? I feel more special than that guy, and he's checking out my car, so. <laughs> it's weird how that works. Anyway, catch you next time, guys.